This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And today we have a very important show. You know, the title is actually QE Infinity. In other words, when will this printing stop? But really it's a discussion, which is better? Gold, silver, or crypto? That's the discussion. And we have a very important guest today. He's John Adams. He's the chief economist for one of my favorite countries in the world, Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. And I've been going to Ozzy since 1976, where I went there to play rugby, and it's my favorite sport. And needless to say, we lost every game, but it was a good, we were good sports about it. But anyway, welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Robert, for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So your topic is QE to infinity, and then... You say there's no turning back now, and I, I totally agree with you. But I want to break it down to gold, silver, or what can a person do, a crypto. So we have a, some kind of a solution. And if you can't endorse any of it, that's fine. But I, I love gold, silver, and crypto because I have an enemy, and we have an enemy in common. It's called the Federal Reserve Bank of America, which keeps printing. And I like what you said about there's no turning back. So before we begin, could you give us a little bit of your background and what you do today? Sure. So in, in terms of what I do today, so I'm an, I, I am an economic commentator here in Australia. My main YouTube channel is a, is a channel called In the Interest of the People that I co-host with one of my partners, Martin North. I am the chief economist for a company in uh, South Australia called As Good As Gold Australia. So we're South Australia's largest bullion dealership, and I've been with them for about three years. So we're helping largely the retail market uh, acquire physical gold, physical silver. And in terms of my background, I've had a very diverse background from working in federal parliament, working as an economic advisor to a federal senator, being a bureaucrat at various levels of government, working for a big foreign capital firm in terms of management consulting. And uh, yeah, look, I've been a writer for a number of mainstream media organizations in Australia, largely about economics, uh, but covering politics and a whole bunch of other public policy areas as well. So first of all, what's going on in Aussie? Because, you know, like I said, it is really, we had, I had offices in five capital cities. I, I love Adelaide, I love the hills. But what is happening in the economy there? Because I hear your real estate is in a bubble and stuff like that, so... What's the macro of Aussie? Sure. So, so in terms of what I've been saying for the last probably five years is we have the biggest debt bubble in Australian history. At the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. I mean, your time is actually very interesting, Robert, because uh, I actually just gave my first seminar for 2021 last week. And um, I updated you know, some of our um, clients uh, about my revised view. So two years ago in 2019, I said that Australia has two debt bubbles, a household debt bubble and a foreign debt bubble. And, you know, obviously we've got, a, you know, that household debt bubble is concentrated pictures in terms of real estate. And uh, anytime I do any interviews with, with the people from the United States, I like to say to people that in the context of um, the household sort of debt bubble and the, and the real estate debt bubble that Americans had before the global financial crisis, uh, if you thought that was extreme, you pretty much haven't seen anything. Um, the, the extreme, if you look at the Australian metrics, uh, we are way more extreme in terms of uh, real estate prices versus sort of income and, and sort of, yeah, like in terms of income, but also household debt relative to income. But we are on much more extreme levels than the United States. But my revised position is, is that we actually have now three debt bubbles. And with COVID-19, we've just seen the federal government here in Australia, state governments and territory governments rack up unprecedented amounts of, of debt to basically save the other two bubbles. As we went into with, with the lockdown in 2020, the reason, well, we had the biggest fiscal and monetary stimulus package in Australian history. And the reason why they were forced to do so is because without that stimulus, we would have seen record amounts of delinquencies and defaults in terms of mortgages. And we would have had a, a financial crisis similar to what, you know, for example, the United States and Ireland went through in 2007, 2008. So in order to avoid that outcome, uh, it, kind of like what you said in terms of opening the show and in terms of central banks continuing to print. Well, we had the biggest money printing campaign in Australian history, coupled with the biggest rack up of um, government debt. And, and, you know, when I say government debt, in the Australian context, if you look at from July 2019, all the way through to the projected June 2024, we're talking $975 billion over five financial years. And, and there's no plan to pay back the debt. There's no plan to balance the budget. And basically we've ruined two generations of Australians in order to facilitate 
say, the financial system. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the Australian economy is in uh, a very dire predicament. And, and then the other thing I would say is in terms of how you open up the show about uh, previous comments I made on other interviews about we can't turn back. Well, uh, particularly in the Australian context, if we ever sought to normalise policy, uh, what that's going to mean is, is that we're, we're going to have high interest rate costs. And for a lot of households that are drowning in debt, they can't meet those repayments. And that will obviously then lead to the Harry Dent scenario of a deflationary depression. So the mentality, having worked in federal parliament and having worked in the mainstream media here in Australia, the mentality among the elite is that a deflationary depression is the worst outcome of all, and we must avoid it at all costs. And, and so that's why they continue to print and spend. And, um, and, and because of that, that's why I came out in, in 2020 with a forecast of, uh, well, not only just a forecast, but, but a statement that we are seeing the beginnings of stagflation here in Australia. And, and, and in the beginning of 2021, I said that with the election of uh, Joe Biden and the um, $1.9 trillion stimulus package passed by Congress and now a $2 trillion stimulus package on infrastructure, I think this uh, stagflation process is going to accelerate as we go throughout 2021 and beyond. So, um, you know, like I said, I first went to Aussie in 1976 and you guys had the same problem then. It's Aussies like to spend money, they travel a lot, they have a good life. Yes. And their personal debt was high. And then they, the Aussie real estate prices, I mean, it's a great place to live. I, I bought two properties in Aussie, one in King's Cross and one in Rushcutters Bay. And I made a lot of money because the inflation was just going high as a kite. But I don't think they ever stopped borrowing money. And so the reason I want to interview you today is because Aussie might be the canary in the coal mine. I mean, what's going to, because Aussie's economy and population is smaller, but it's very similar to America. Very, very similar. So you're saying there's a personal debt bubble. There is a real estate debt bubble, the same as the U.S. And now you have a nationwide debt bubble, right? Yes, yes. I mean, one of the points I'll make, Robert, is, is that when you look at the, if you look at the debt profile of American households before the GFC, a lot of poor people got into the real estate bubble right. um, when they when they couldn't actually afford to be in the real estate market. The, the big difference between America and Australia is the bulk of the household debt is actually with high-income people as opposed to low-income people. And some some Ameri Australian commentators have said, well, you know, there's no comparison between Australia and the United States because people who, who can service the mortgages actually have the bulk of the debt. Now, the problem with that argument is that our debt profile is, is, is very similar to what happened in Ireland. So middle income to high income people in Ireland before the global financial crisis had the bulk of the debt. And then and then when the GFC uh, crashed, or when the GFC occurred, the Irish economy basically went through the floor. So while we have a debt, different debt distribution compared to America, um, whether it's the, uh, America, Ireland or Australia, yeah, we are in a situation that we can never that we can never return to. And, and the other thing I will say is that because you, you talked about about um, the 1970s. So we did have, obviously, stagflation both in America and Australia in the 1970s. But if you look at personal debt levels, so the last time we had a household debt bubble in Australia was actually in the 1880s. And we had a depression in 1892, which was actually worse for Australia compared to the Great Depression. And now debt levels for households in 2021 are substantially higher than where we were in the 1880s on a proportional basis. One more question, because another one of my really favorite countries is Kiwiland, New Zealand, and the Great All Blacks. How does New Zealand's economy compare to Ireland and to Aussie? Yes, so yes, that they probably do have a very similar situation where they do have elevated levels of household debt, um, and they do have ha high house prices. But I would say that their situation is nowhere near as extreme as uh, where we are here in Australia. So, yes. Yeah, so, so do they have a problem? Sure. But is it, a, is it as bad as where we are here in, uh, down under? Probably not. And, and a lot of Americans are running to New Zealand to hide. Have you heard that? Y yes, yes. I mean, they look at, I mean, over the last few years, I've heard a range of stories of Americans losing confidence in the American government, in the American legal system, in the American economy, and, and, and a whole bunch of Americans want to escape. So New Zealand is definitely one of those locations where a lot of Americans have 
fled to. But it, but the other interesting thing I should say, Robert, is is that I've also heard a lot of Americans going down to uh, South America, particularly in Chile. And no doubt, if you go down to the southern parts of Chile, you'll find a few expat communities being. Uh, I mean, they're developing and they're growing, and uh, and yeah, so that could be potentially another area where Americans may find refuge. I'm not kidding you. I love Aussie. You know, I just really, really do. Would you suggest Americans run there? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the thing is, look, so, so probably what I would say is that w- there are some advantages, I think, living in Australia compared to the United States, but but also I think there are some, there are definitely some, there are some disadvantages as well. So, yeah, so I would say that the cost of living situation here in Australia is perhaps more pronounced than what it, what it is in America. But on the other hand, uh, while I think we have some corruption issues here in Australia, I don't think they're anywhere as close as to what the Americans have. Yeah. For those who may not know, Australia really is like the promised land to me. It's, you know, you have great medical, everything is great as long as you don't make your money there because your government wants to take it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's probably another thing I would point out. Our tax rates are much higher yeah. than where the uh, taxes are in terms of the United States as well. Okay, so you're an economist for Good as Gold Australia. What does Good as Gold Australia do? Yes, as Good as Gold Australia, so we've basically been in business since about 2012. We're a retail dealership. So we basically, we provide to the market uh, gold, silver, platinum, and a whole host of uh, retail denominations. Uh, We do storage, we do insurance. Yeah, so I mean, particularly as we continue to see money printing, central bank um, sort of central banks around the world get out of control. I mean, the, the owners of the business thought that it was time to help more Australians, uh, and, we all, and we have a growing international client base as well, help more people escape the fiat currency system and get into gold and silver. Uh, obviously, I've listened to you on multiple interviews, Robert, and, and I know that this journey for you uh, started, um, uh, but look, correct me if I'm wrong, was it, was it when you went to Vietnam or before Vietnam that you started buying silver? I started buying silver in 64 when I was 17 because of Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law says when bad money enters the system, good money goes into hiding. So when I was 17 in 1964, they started debasing our dimes and quarters and half dollars. So there was a copper tinge around it. Yes. And I didn't know anything, but Gresham's Law does apply because immediately I didn't trust my dimes, quarters, and half dollars. And I started going to the bank and turning in dollars, paper dollars, and getting rolls of dimes, quarters, and half dollars, and I'd pull out the real silver. And I'd put the copper copper silver back in there, and then I'd go back to the bank and kept trading. And the trouble was, uh, then I went to school in New York at 17, 18, and my mother spent my money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's it kind of made my point that poor people don't know good money from bad money. That's the biggest problem. My mom and dad had no idea why I was running back and forth to the bank as this kid, high school kid, turning in fake paper money, getting rolls of dimes, quarters, and half dollars, and pulling out the real silver and trading in. And my mother says, well, I spent it while you're in school. I'm going, and I think we're talking about why there's so many poor people is they don't know good money from fake money. And I'm going to have one more question to you that I'm excited about. Here in America, you know, you have the Perth Mint, and we've heard that there's a shortage of silver in Perth. I don't know if that's true or not. But when we come back, that's what I want to talk to you about because the real subject here, it really is QE infinity. I don't think the banks can turn back. They have to keep printing. Exactly. And the question is, what are you going to do? Gold, silver, or crypto, or Bitcoin, or Ethereum? So that's kind of my discussion today because we've got to know good money from fake money. We'll be right back. In 2021, a truly diversified portfolio needs to be more than the traditional mix of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It needs private real estate. Studies have shown that portfolios with an allocation to private real estate generally delivered a better risk-adjusted return with more annual income and with lower volatility over the past two decades thanks to its track record of consistent performance through multiple market cycles. With Fundrise, this powerful level of diversification is now available to you. Fundrise provides access to diversified portfolios of real estate to all investors with their industry-leading, easy-to-use platform. Whether you're looking to add stable cash flow via dividends or prefer long-term growth through appreciation, 
Fundrise makes investing in private real estate as easy as investing in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages all of their real estate projects. And with their easy to use website, you can track your portfolio's performance and watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via dynamic asset updates. See for yourself how 150,000 investors have built a better portfolio with private real estate. It takes just a few minutes to get started. Go to fundrise.com slash rich dad today. That's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash rich dad. Fundrise.com slash rich dad. Wish you were in early on some of the best performing IPOs of 2019 and 2020. Our crowd investors were. And now you can join them in what's next. With our crowd, accredited investors have access to invest directly, easily, and most importantly, early. Our crowd investors have benefited from our crowd companies IPOing like Beyond Meat or being bought by companies like Intel, Nike, Microsoft, and Oracle. Our crowd's investment professionals leverage their extensive network to review some of the most promising private companies and startups in the world. Their in-depth due diligence includes meeting with management teams and generally comprehensive vetting of deals they decide to make part of their own portfolio. Once our crowd has selected a deal, they offer accredited investors the opportunity to invest alongside them with the same terms. As you review deals, you have access to our crowd's investor relations team who you can talk to directly on the phone about your personal investment goals. The investment professionals at our crowd have already reviewed thousands of companies, invested hundreds of millions of dollars, closed investments in over 200 companies, chosen dozens of companies that have made exits. Right now, you can become part of our crowd's investment in Launchpad, revolutionary AI-powered autonomous manufacturing that incorporates 3D printing to efficiently combine multiple materials into complex products. Launchpad is backed by Idea Lab, the startup incubator co-founded by famed VC Bill Gross that has launched over 150 companies ranging from hardware and robotics to clean tech. You can get in early on Launchpad and other unique opportunities at OurCrowd.com slash RichDad. If you're interested in investing, you need to join Our Crowd. The Our Crowd account is free. Just go to OurCrowd.com slash RichDad. Robert Kiyosaki is one of the first financial educators to back and buy Bitcoin. Why? Robert believes that the dollar weakens through the printing of trillions of dollars by the Federal Reserve. Bitcoin, like gold, should only get stronger. And right now, the stock market is in the biggest bubble it has ever been. If you're planning for retirement, you might need to consider a new strategy, a new asset. It is time to consider Bitcoin. But how? Let me introduce BitTrust IRA. If you already have an IRA, listen carefully. BitTrust IRA helps you seamlessly and securely add cryptocurrencies to your portfolio. BitTrust IRA stores your private keys in nuclear bunkers with military-grade encryption. They have 24-7 trading platform with no minimum investment and unlimited trades, plus a team to help guide you along the way if you have any questions. They also offer the lowest trading fees in the industry. So if you want to add Bitcoin to your existing retirement plan, go to BitTrustIRA.com slash RichDad today to learn more. BitTrustIRA.com slash RichDad. And for a limited time, BitTrust IRA is waiving the sign-up fee for Rich Dad listeners, a $50 value. Pretty awesome. That's BitTrustIRA.com slash RichDad. B-I-T-T-R-U-S-T-I-R-A dot com slash RichDad. Listen, you can't afford to ignore Bitcoin anymore. Bitcoin has been one of the best performing assets of 2020 thus far. So while the dollar is beginning to fail, Bitcoin is growing stronger. Robert says to get gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Visit bittrustira.com slash rich dad today to learn more and get your $50 signup fee eliminated. That's bittrustira.com slash rich dad, B-I-T-T-R-U-S-T-I-R-A.com slash rich dad. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And today our guest is John Adams. He's an economist for Go to School Australia, my favorite countries in the world. And if I was going to run, I'd run to Australia because it's, it's, it is heaven. It is a fantastic place to live, except you don't want to make your money there. <laughs> and we're going to be discussing 
his topic is QE infinity. In other words, can they stop printing? I don't think so. And that question, next question goes, where do you go then? Gold, silver, or crypto, Bitcoin, or Ethereum, or whatever they got today. But before we go on, we have my dear friend, Harry Dent, who I toured Australia with several times. John, what is Harry predicting now? <laughs> Well, yes. So, so probably since the GFC, Harry Dent has been predicting a deflationary depression. And when you think of what that actually means is, so if you think in the in the classical Austrian school, let's say Ludwig von Mises about um, what is inflation, inflation is the expansion of the money supply. So to have deflation, what that means is the money supply must shrink. And the only way in the current context of that that's going to happen is that is that the debt is going to shrink. And how are you going to shrink the debt? You have to have a series of defaults. Now, every time we've had a point of crisis since 2008, the central banks and the national governments around the world continue to print and spend to stop the debt bubble from imploding. And, and, and so far, that has been successful. So whether you think about the sovereign debt crisis of 2012 or, for example, the repo crisis in New York in uh, 2019 or COVID-19 2020, or even if you look at the end of um, February 2021 in terms of how the bond market, particularly in the United States, but it started to spread to Australia, uh, Japan, and Germany. Every time there's there's some sort of systemic risk coming to the fore, they try to print and spend and provide liquidity so that you don't have that sort of situation from occurring. So when it comes to Harry... What's Harry's latest prediction now? Well, I mean, so, so uh, about three months ago, Harry gave an interview on Stanbury Research and said that he's expecting the stock market to collapse by 40, 50% by April. Well, here we are in the last week of April and so far that hasn't happened. And I think your your assistant in the in the break said that his new forecast was going to be June, July. The uh, stock market's going to collapse. Now, you know, you could be right. Well, well yes. So, so, so what I would say is that in the absence of the money printing, Harry would be 100% correct. So I've never sort of said that a deflationary depression is off the table. But where I think Harry has got it wrong is I mean, I did an interview with him in here in Sydney in 2018, and I asked him, well, you know, why can't the central banks continue to print to infinity? And he basically said that someone, you know, there will be voices in the market, there will be political opposition to the central banks, and that opposition is going to stop hyperinflation, like, a, uh, you know, the, the QE2 infinity type scenario that we have now. And that opposition is going to prevent them from saving the bubble, and that's how the bubble collapses. Well, so far... You know, three years beyond the, 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 when I interviewed Harry here in Sydney, no one has stopped the central banks. So, and, and, and you know, the other thing I'll say, Robert, is, is that now we're seeing the central banks starting to take over governments. So you've got Janet Yellen, now the Treasury Secretary. You've got Mario Draghi, now the Prime Minister of Italy. And, and you've got a whole bunch of other sort of characters. Mark Carey was head of England, Bank of England. Indeed, indeed. So, yes, so you're starting to see central bank officials now move into the executive uh, branches right. of governments and they're trying to solidify their political power. So whereas Harry is saying that there's going to be political limitations to the central banks, so far that hasn't happened. And and, and, and so, so that's why I think we're going to see more of an inflationary situation moving forward compared to in terms of deflation. And, and, and you know, I know we're about to get into this conversation about gold, silver and crypto, but the, but the, uh, what I would say to your audience is, is portfolio allocation changes so dramatically compared to if you believe... So if you believe deflation is coming, your portfolio allocation would be dramatically different compared to if you believe that we're going to have some sort of inflationary outcome. And, and, and you know, before, you know, investors start to think about, well, what do I put, what, so where do I, how do I allocate my capital? Um, you, you really have to get the macro picture right. Um, and, and, you know, obviously I've been studying economics for, for more than 20 years, but uh, I know a lot of people who, who do believe in the, the inflationary scenario and there are some who, who believe in the inflationary scenario. So, so I think that, investors need to really get their head around, well, what have the central banks and the government been doing since 2008? And do we see any prospect of any changes moving forward? So let me give you a chance to promote Good as Gold Australia. You know, you say you sell to people outside. Why would an American, I mean, the real reason I would go to Australia is behind your head. It's Sydney Harbour. I mean, that is the most beautiful place. You know, if there's going to, if there's going to be a crash, I'm going to go there and buy in real estate, because that place is, is so gorgeous. Why would an American buy gold from Good as Gold Australia? 
Well, I mean, the thing is, well, I mean, the the United States has a history of gold nationalization. So some people call it confiscation. What what FDI did in 1933, 34, and, and and obviously when you look at the LBJ, you had a problem in terms of the demonetization of silver. So so yeah, so the the American government has a history of you know doing adverse things to American citizens, whether it's. Uh, uh, taking people's gold away, nationalization, making the ownership of gold illegal, or doing things with silver. We haven't had that sort of history here in Australia. So, so I do think that when you look at the context of property rights and, and, and your ability to protect your wealth from a legal point of view, I think there's less legal and political risk in Australia compared to uh, the United States. So for those of you looking at John Adams, behind his head is a picture of Sydney Harbour, and that leads out to the uh, Opera House. And, you know, if there's a crash, I'm coming. Because <laughs> in real estate. So, so I mean, we'd love to have you, Robert, but obviously one of the big uh, impediments perhaps for you coming is this whole notion of COVID-19 vaccines and whether they're going to implement some sort of vaccine passport. So, uh, yeah, and like a, I'm not sure your views on that, but, but no. a lot of Australians <clears throat> and a lot of people around the world are very nervous about this whole situation. Yeah, it's, it's fascism to me. But anyway, uh, tell me what, I don't know if the Perth Mint is your competitor or what, but what is the rumor about them not having enough silver? Sure. So, yeah. So now um, w one thing I will say is, is that we are actually an approved distributor for the Perth Mint. So we have a number of sources where we uh, obtain product, gold and silver, and the Perth Mint, um, that, that is one of them. So in the context of the Perth Mint, I mean, I've been on a bit of a campaign starting last year, largely about what I call synthetic gold and silver. Um, and, 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 and these sort of products are things like unallocated, pull allocated accounts um, and I probably could spend the next hour with you telling them, telling you about what's happened with the Perth Mint. But we started to hear a range of stories late February, early March of people not being able to buy silver at the retail level in, in, in Perth from the Perth Mint. We also heard stories of wholesalers not being able to buy um, large amounts of silver from the Perth Mint, even though they said on record they have 60 tonnes available for sale. We, as, a, as good as got Australia, we got told that starting at the first of April, uh, first of March, we cannot place any order on the Perth Mint or for any sort of uh, uh, order because they were running short of silver. But also, we we started to hear a range of stories around customers who had unallocated or pull it allocated accounts, particularly in silver, standing for delivery, and there was a commitment by the Perth Mint, according to their website, to deliver in ten days, and they just could not deliver in ten days. And you know, on the one hand, they said that they they had the silver, but they had a manufacturing and fabrication problem. But I've had numerous people who have said, "Well, I don't want small products. If you've got thousand ounce bars, I'll take those thousand ounce bars." And sometimes people have been able to get them. In a lot of cases, they have not, and it's been an ongoing saga going forward. And one thing I should say, Robert, is is that um. So Craig Hemke from the TF, uh, well, TF Minutes Report and in terms of Sprott Money, he wrote an article on the 2nd of February saying that this silver squeeze movement was not going to manifest itself into a crisis in New York or London, but it was going to result in a crisis either in Perth, Zurich or Montreal with these unallocated accounts. And uh, six weeks after he wrote that, uh, Perth blew up. So, uh, so, so there are some very smart cookies in the silver market who, who have a very good feel as to uh, you know, what's happening in the physical market, where the shortages are, wh where some of these uh, syn uh, synthetic fractional reserve programs are running. Um, and Craig Kemp, he called it, was the first in the market around the world to call it, and he was dead right. So that's what confuses me. What is an un unaccounted or countable account? What, what is that? Yeah. So, so in the American context, if you buy silver or gold and you have it someone so you buy the physical and someone holds it for you i mean in the american context that's called allocated and segregated whereas in here in australia it's called allocated now um in the context of the perth mint unallocated is so so technically you don't own any silver but you own a promissory note but what you have but but in buying a promissory note you buy an interest in the working capital of the Perth Mint. So the so the, the, obviously the Perth Mint has a X tons of silver that is on hand um, as part of their manufacturing process. And, and they basically say that you buy a share of that uh, that unallocated pool. And, and, and so in that context, if the price of silver was to move, well, you, you can obviously enjoy that price exposure by getting a cash redemption at the prevailing market price. Or the other hand is if you want to convert from 
unallocated to allocated will you pay a fabrication fee and then they'll take that raw silver and then convert that into a bar that you legally will own. So that's what they call unallocated. So it's not really a futures contract. It's it's really you have an IOU to take delivery. Exactly. But exactly. you don't know if it's there. So this is the, so I'm, I'm glad I'm talking to you because as, as good as gold in Aus, as Australia, as an insider, yes, you know, like I I love silver. You know, people see me on Fox Television in America all the time saying, I love silver, and so. The question I have for you, for the average punter out there, which is a better buy today, gold, silver, or crypto? Well, in terms of my portfolio, so I don't own any crypto. Why is that? Why is that? Well, probably three key reasons. The first is is that we have a long, we have a five thousand year history with gold and silver, and cryptos have only been around for ten years, uh, or about like, ten to twelve years. So we don't know if we had a really systemic financial crisis. Well, what's going to have to happen to cryptocurrencies? We, we don't really know. So so I think that there's a lot of risk, a lot of market risk that a lot of people in the sector haven't don't really understand because we've never gone through that situation before. That's point one. Point two is that the big the number one reason why people are buying cryptocurrencies is because it's going up. But uh, but you know one thing I like to do when I allocate capital is I like to get a very deep technical understanding of what I'm actually doing. And, and and for example, Robert, if you gave me the code for Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus um, Litecoin, et cetera, I mean, now I'm an economist, but I'm not, not a cryptologist. So I can't tell you at a technical level, what do these codes actually do uh, and what are the differences and what are the risks and what are the opportunities? And, and I would say 99.9% .9 of crypto investors are not cryptologists, and they cannot, uh, they do not understand these underlying computer codes, what they actually do. And the only reason why they're buying them is because the price is going up. Yeah. And, and, and if, if, you, if you don't actually understand at a technical level what these codes do, we don't actually understand the risk of the asset. Right. Um, so that's point two. Now, point three is, so the funny thing is, I did a seminar in Adelaide last week with the School of Scott Australia. And in the Q&A, I actually had a question about crypto. And I actually asked the audience, um, and there was about 140 people in the audience, and I said, well, uh, how many people here tonight actually own cryptocurrencies? And about half the audience put their hand up. And I said, wow. how many of you actually understand that in 1996, the National Security Agency in the, in, in the United States wrote a white paper for MIT about cryptocurrencies? And only one, put it, only one person put his hand up. And, and so the, the real question I have is, well, who was Satoshi Nakamoto? I mean, because because I, I dare say it could well be the American government is behind the whole cryptocurrency phenomena. Now, I've got some different theories as to why that is, but you know, a lot of people again haven't looked into the history of cryptocurrencies. They don't know that the NSA wrote a white paper about this. And and, and again, I think there's much more to the crypto story than than what the average American or the average Australian investor are fully aware of. I, I agree. I agree 100. percent But I, you know, I, I'm a trader in crypto. I'm not an investor. Uh -huh, I got gotcha. you. So if you know what I do, what I mean. So when it when it dropped to seven thousand a coin, I got back in. So still, I'm in the money quite a bit right now, and I, you know, I know it can go go to zero also. So I'm well aware of that. Whereas gold, I call gold and silver are God's money. So I have a lots of That's gold right. and silver. I have a final one quick question, Ozzy. Your economy is really dependent upon Chinese because you're you're a, you're a resource company. You export into China. How's how many Chinese are moving into Aussie, and how is your relationship with China, right? Aussie's relationship. So 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 yeah. So so well, I mean, probably in the last twelve months, we've had limited um, travel, travel uh, right. between between Australia in terms of China. But but, but yeah, we've had a lot of people from China. Uh, well, we have a lot of people from from Southeast Asia, China. And India come to Australia every year because they come to get a university education here in Australia. And that process has been happening for the last 20 years. And, and a lot of students, when they graduate, they, they decide to stay here in Australia as opposed to go back to China or India or wherever the case may be. So, so yeah, so we do have a significant Asian population here in Australia. And, you know, and, and, and like here in Australia, everything's going well, I think, from a social relation point of view. Now, when it comes to uh, diplomatic relations, um, there definitely has been increased tensions between Australia and China over the last 12 months. A lot of this is driven by uh, our relationship we, we, in, term, in terms of America. So I think, you know, the, 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 you know we're, we're seeing 
the strategic battlefield uh, sort of changed quite dramatically as China's rise, as China continues to rise. A lot of lot of um, tension in Southeast Asia about the South China Sea. I mean, I, our national position is that we we support the freedom of navigation through the South China Sea, and we oppose any restrictions on on the freedom of movement, uh, whether by China or any other country. But we have been more critical of various elements of the, of the Chinese regime, and that has resulted in uh, worsening political relationships. And we have seen some sanctions by China on Australia, in, in particular commodities. Like I think there's been some issues with coal, there's been some issues with wine, uh, and a couple of other sort of um, areas as well. But but our main export to China, which is iron ore, that continues because they 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 need that iron ore. And uh, but obviously we we hope. We're, you know, look, for, look in terms of, I think a lot of Australians, including myself, we hope for peace and we hope for um, good relations with both America and China. And we, we hope that, that, that any uh, strategic disputes can be resolved peacefully. Yeah, but you got to watch out for those Kiwis. You know, they're sneaky. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking at, to be honest, I'm not particularly afraid of New Zealand. I mean, they, they, you know, <laughs> you better be afraid of the All Blacks. Yeah, well, I mean, look, we can talk about sport, but uh, yeah, look, <laughs> if, if they ever got out of line, we could send down the, our military and take over New Zealand within a few hours. <laughs> hey, John, thank you very much for information. And then, how can people get in touch with you as good as gold if they want to talk? We don't endorse anything, by the way. I'm just. I'm just happy to talk to John because he knows so much about it, this very important part of the corner of the world near China and uh, New Zealand. Yes. So, I mean, in terms of myself, I have, uh, I'm on Twitter. So, I look, people can find me at, at Adams Economics. I actually have my own personal website, adamseconomics.com. Uh, so, yeah, people can look up As Good As Gold Australia. We have a website. We have a YouTube channel. And, and yeah, the thing is, like, feel free to reach out to me personally or reach out to the company. And, and if you're looking for gold or silver platinum, we're definitely happy to help. Yeah, John, thank you. Thank you very much. You live in God's country except for your taxes. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. Take care. And we come back, we'll be finishing up with a final word on gold, silver, or crypto and what's happening with China and New Zealand. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyos, Talking the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And today we're talking about it's QE infinity, why they have to keep printing. But the bigger question is a gold, silver, or crypto. And I don't think we answer anybody's questions, but either you're in favor or not in favor. And FYI, we don't endorse anything, although I own all three, including Ethereum, I don't endorse it. But uh, can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, or YouTube. And then uh, all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. And we archive it for one reason, so you can listen to it again. But if you have friends, family members, or business associates, please listen to this program and discuss so I want to thank John Adams, go to school in Australia. And uh, I tell you what, if you guys can, sitting behind his head was a picture just in front of the Sydney Opera House. And if the real estate market crashes, I'm going there. It is one of the most beautiful spots on earth. It really is. The whole country is spectacular. They have such a great lifestyle, but they're highly socialist. You know, they, they make California look like a conservative state. <laughs> And I just love it. You know, my favorite sport is rugby. And the All Blacks are, All Blacks and the Wallabies are formidable. I mean, they just produce the best rugby teams in the world. So that's why you know, I just love that country. I love the people. And, you know, I've, I have bought property there. I wish I hadn't sold it. But it is such a great lifestyle, great people, a lot of fun. They're right in the middle of Asia. You know, they've got Singapore on one side. And Myanmar right now is blowing up. They have Vietnam, they have China, they have Hong Kong, and they have Taiwan and Japan. So it is such a uh, crossroads for us, let's say English speaking. So if you have a chance, if you haven't been to Australia before, please go there and you know take in New Zealand too. They're great, great countries. So anyway, with that said, Sarah, what did you think? Oh, he was a wealth of information. But I, you opened the show with, we're not sure if we answered the question. And John kind of made that point because we were talking about Harry Dent and Harry's been <laughs> deflationary and he's, you know, some people are calling for inflation, hyperinflation. So he said that your portfolio allocation will depend on whether what you believe in. Right. And that's where, so I think it, we did kind of answer the question. If you believe what Harry Dent believes in, you'll do, you know, hold a little bit more of this versus, you know. So I thought it was an, a cool show. We touched on a ton of topics. Yeah. And so this will definitely be one that we want people to listen over and over again. And one question that I'd like to pose to our, our listeners is, if you caught the very end, John was talking about 
how the NSA wrote white paper on cryptocurrency back in 1996. So if you would like us to bring John back on to discuss that, because I don't think he's talked about it based on his tone. I've never heard about it before. And I don't, he was very cryptic about it, cryptic mm. about crypto. If you are interested in us maybe talking yeah, about that know. topic, let us know in the comment section, because that is something I'm interested in that I definitely perked up. So, But a great, great interview. And i um, looking forward to Harry's rebuttal when we interview <laughs> him next week. So. Harry, Harry is another good friend, but he's... You, know, you look up pessimist in the dictionary, it's this picture in there. And I agree with him. It's just he's always making these dates that don't happen. And so that's why with the Rich Dad Radio program, we don't make any recommendations and we do our best to be as educational as possible. So I want to thank everybody listening to the Rich Dad Radio program. And we have never been here before. You know, America is now the biggest debtor nation in the world. So that's why I've been buying gold, silver, and now crypto, Bitcoin, and Ethereum because I simply do not trust the central bank or the U.S. Treasury and things like that. So anyway, it's an exciting time. And if you have a chance to go to Aussie, 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 it's a great place to visit. Thank you very much. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout, it is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate, and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.